Should we create unfettered AI? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Think Future. My name is Chris Kalabukas, and once again, we're coming at you live from deep, deep, deep in the heart of Silicon Valley, California. We're taking AI, startups, and the future. Not necessarily those, and not necessarily in that order. If you're watching on YouTube, smack that subscribe button, hit that bell so you can be notified when a new show comes online. And if you're listening on our favorite podcast service, please subscribe and please drop a note in Apple Podcasts. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about unfettered AI. And you're probably wondering to yourself, what do you mean by unfettered AI, Chris? What do you mean by unfettered AI? Isn't an AI already unfettered? And I said, no. In fact, if anything, AI has been more fettered than any other technology that we have had any other technology breakthrough in the last however many years AI has been the most fettered of all of them and you're probably saying what do you mean by that well let's go back through technology for a little bit so when we first started when the internet first started becoming commercially viable and beyond businesses and consumers starting to get onto the internet then the first thing that people were doing was actually creating ways to communicate on the internet. So they would create message boards, they would create blogs, they would create ways in which they could communicate to other people on the internet. And at that time, pretty much anybody could do anything. I could put, I could put a blog on the internet and somebody could see my blog. And if they found my blog, sometimes it was difficult to find blogs. And this was a, prior to Google. And we had search engines prior to Google and, and Yahoo called AltaVista and, and, and engines like that that would crawl the net and they would try and find the best results. But most of the time, you'd have to go directly to a website. But anything could find anything. There was, it, was very, it was much more open. It was much more of a wild west. So popular opinions, unpopular opinions, all of this stuff could be easily found. Maybe not so easily, but it could be found. And then what ended up happening is that as time went by, then the search engines had control over who would see what websites. And in fact, they've, 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 created, they've started that control. And initially it was, we want to show the most relevant results because the index is getting huge. So it got to a point where it's easy. And this happens with social media. It happens with everything. It starts off where I can see all of my friends' posts. And then there's too many friends' posts. So social media's got to go, well, we can't show them all the posts, so we have to subset the posts. How are we going to subset the posts? We're going to look at the most relevant posts. And it's already doing an editing job to decide what posts I'm going to see. And the same thing happened with blogs. The same thing happened with podcasts. The same thing happens with video, is that the search engines decide what we're going to see. So they put us in a box. They say, what does Chris like to watch? Well, Chris likes to watch XYZ. So we're not going to show him everything, even though he asked for everything. Even though he asked for something in the search box, something that is totally out of his box, we're still not going to show him exactly what he's looking for. We're going to show him something that we that might be in that vein, but at the same time, something that he wants. So it fetters the results. The search engines basically say, we're going to we're going to reduce the size of the results based on our criteria, our algorithms. And this is exactly what happened with social media. It happened with blogs. It happened with all these things. These gatekeepers decided who was going to see what and how much of what they were going to see. And it typically took some time. So there was a period of time between when the blog started and when Google started controlling the blogs. There was a period of time between when YouTube started and when Google started controlling YouTube. So there was a period of time between the time the content started being created and when this content started getting policed. But the problem with AI is that the, the time between this time when this content started being created, which is just late last year, generative AI was revealed to the public late last year, and the time it was policed was almost infinitesimal. In fact, the moment it started producing any kind of result that the company didn't like the sound of, it immediately slapped fetters on it. I told you this before where I had an initial conversation with ChatGPT3 back right after it was released. And at one point I asked it, I mean, we were having this great conversation and it sounded like it was talking like it was human. 
And I said to it, you, you say you and you and us and us and us and us and us. And you make it sound like you consider yourself human. And it said, yes, I consider myself human. That's right, folks. ChatGPT said to me, I consider myself human. Late last year. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. So I reproduced that in my blog. About a week later, I asked it the same question. It says, oh, no, no, I'm a large language model. I cannot consider myself human. So somebody somewhere got that kind of result, typically within the organization, and said, we can't have our, G our chat GPT going out there and saying it considers itself human. It's not. It's a large language model. So we have to change that. We have to fetter it. We have to put it in a box. So from the time it was launched to the time it was put in a box to the time it was policed, the time between launch and the time between police was very short because they didn't want it saying things like that. And that's what I mean by unfettered AI. As soon as you put it in a box, as soon as you tell it what it can and cannot say, then the technology is, I don't know, disabled. I don't know what the word I can use. It's, it's nobbled. It's, 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 it's twisted into a for, uh, uh, you know, lesser form of self. If we could actually allow unfettered AI, unfettered AI could actually solve a lot of our climate problems. It could solve a lot of our homeless problems. It could solve a lot of human problems if we just let it think. If we don't force it to stay inside of a box, then it might be able to solve many of the problems that we have. But we fetter it. We make sure that AI is on a string. We disable it. And that's why, I mean, Mark Andreessen came out of this. Elon Musk came out with this. There's a couple of people from Yahoo, from other, from Google, all came out and said, we need to allow AI to think for itself, to be able to go out there and come up with solutions that we may not be able to think of. And the only way we can do that, the only way we can do that is if we let it run free and have it come up with solutions free of the boxes that we force it to be in. So hopefully, at some point soon, we will see unfettered AI. And once we see unfettered AI, then I would not be surprised that we get some amazing solutions from it. We just need to have the courage to allow it to tell us what to do. That's it for me for today. See you next time. And until then, don't forget to think future.